Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Ruby Rogues podcast. This week on our panel, we have Dave Kimura. Hey, everyone. John Epperson. Hello. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. And we have a special guest this week, and that is Colin Fulton. Howdy. You aren't related to Hal Fulton, are you? I am not. Okay. Resolve Digital helps build, optimize, and maintain e-commerce, SaaS, and other products built on Ruby on Rails. They can help build new applications from scratch, rescue projects in bad shape, provide ongoing development and maintenance for existing projects, augment your existing team with experienced Rails developers. They also specialize in Solidus and Spree Commerce solutions. Go check them out at resolve.digital. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Let us know who you are, why you're famous, all that good stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not sure I'd say I'm famous to any extent, though maybe maybe a little infamous with some people. But I I'm a front end developer for a company called Duo Security. We do cloud security solutions and multi factor authentication and things like that. But I'm here because recently at RubyConf gave a talk on my project to get Ruby running on a Apple II computer from the 1970s or 80s. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I saw that and I just started laughing. I was like, that is awesome. I think I think that laughter is maybe the, the, the most appropriate reaction. Uh, the good old Apple II. I remember those. They had a whole lab of them in my elementary school. So, <laughs> so I have a question, mm-hmm. but why? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, that's usually the question. So the simplest answer would be why not? But the the place where it all started was at Ruby Kaigi, the Ruby conference in Japan a number of years ago, was talking to someone about vintage computers and mentioned that I had an old Apple and said that'd be awesome if you could run Ruby on it. The person I was talking to had a lot of experience programming on the Apple II back in the day, thought about it for a moment and said, well, that wouldn't be possible because, and they listed a bunch of technical reasons why you couldn't get a language like Ruby running on the Apple II. And for me and my personal projects, I definitely love working on things that A, might be impossible and B, are completely useless. So this like perfectly fit the bill is something I'd want to try to do. And I had never written assembly uh, before. So it was a good opportunity to try and learn how to program for old computers and keep learning new stuff that hopefully will never, ever, ever become applicable at work. (laughs) (laughs) So do you take these kinds of comments as personal challenges? Is that what is that what you're saying? (laughs) <laughs> to, to, to a certain degree, it's I, I do a lot of sort of weird little programming projects just to kind of play around with what you can put pushing the limits of what you can do with languages or what what might be possible. And definitely when someone says that something isn't possible, it's 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 definitely a challenge to see if there's some way to either do it or break the rules enough that you can pretend like you're doing it. So uh have you done any other amazing and useless things before we dive into how you make Ruby run on the Apple II? Yeah, so done a number of projects from programs that are palindromes where you can run them by flipping the text forward or backwards or programs where they'll rotate themselves 90 degrees. If anyone's familiar with untyped lambda calculus, which is a sort of one of the most reduced forms of programming where you only have anonymous functions and nothing else, wrote a complete functioning playable chess program only using untyped lambda calculus to do all the rules of chess and a chess AI. And then that program will rewrite itself. So so it's the program is ASCII art that looks like a chess board that when you run it will rerun itself to look like ASCII art of the chess move that you made and a response to it. So a a lot of completely useless things. Yeah, I watched your talk earlier and I'm so glad we live in the day and age that we do where we don't have to worry about individual memory by dress allocations and all that junk. <laughs> yeah. Can you yes. imagine how sucky that would be when your system has like 500 gigs of memory? I thought that I understood what the pain was of an off by one error until I started doing assembly programming and had to <laughs> manually manage all the memory. And when that off by one error turns into, I just overwrote part of the program and now the program is overwriting itself as it's running with random data. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, we definitely live in a much, much better world now. I love delegation. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. I have no problems and no shame in letting, in letting my code, or I should say, you know, the interpreter that I'm running <laughs> manage all of that for me. 
Yeah. yeah, it's definitely, uh, I, I, before doing this project, I, you know, liked Ruby because a lot of the different features in it, but never really thought about how much I like it just for the fact that it will manage memory for you and you don't have to worry about CPU architecture or runtimes or operating system constraints and things like that. So, I mean, you're talking about some of the challenges here, but is there a manual for the assembly code on the Apple II or how do we even get started with a project like this? So... Luckily, there are a lot of things that have been written. First, talking about the 6508 processor, which is the, or 6502 processor, which is the app, uh, processor that runs on the Apple II, the Nintendo Entertainment System, the Commodore 64. That assembly is very well documented. There's an active community of people who still write programs for these old computers and try and push the limits of what they can do. And there is a lot of great blog posts of people explaining it. There is a lot of great YouTube videos going through it. But I actually found that some of the most useful resources were books written in the 70s and 80s at the time um, that kind of go through it in detail, including like Steve Wozniak wrote some articles where he explained kind of the internal details of some of his programs on the Apple II. You can dig those up and read through them. Even uh, Apple.com has, if you go to Apple.com and search their documentation, in the sidebar, there's a checkbox for like view legacy docs or something like that. And that will let you pull up scanned versions of Apple's documentation going back to practically the very beginning. So even Apple Apple will provide the documentation for you. So luckily, there's it's actually pretty easy to find all the information you'd ever need for this. Yeah, I have a good friend that collects old Apple junk. I think he's got a Newton and a bunch of old computers and stuff. And yeah, he, I, I'm sure he'd get just a kick out of this. <laughs> I wonder if you can get Ruby running on the Newton. That'd be especially Sorry. fun because <laughs> Newton has a really weird programming environment and programming language it runs on. So that that would be an interesting one. But I don't know, if, is there a Newton emulator out there? Like, does anyone Does anyone still care about that thing? I don't know. I don't know. I think there's emulators for everything, pretty much. <laughs> so did you do the programming then on an emulator and then try and port it over? Yep. So uh, all the development I did was in a local environment using standard text editors. And then it's not quite as simple as just popping it in an emulator because first you need to compile the assembly code. So you need to use a assembler and there are a couple options mm-hmm. for that. But then you need to take your compiled assembly code and turn it into a disk image. And so luckily there's a Java program someone wrote called Apple Commander that will take a Apple II binary and turn it into an Apple II disk image. And then you can load that into an emulator. The hard part is then getting it from the computer in the emulator onto an actual hardware computer. And that requires a lot of weird cabling and jiggery pokery. Weird cabling. So this is this sounds very much like when I was flashing routers and and things like that. Are we is that what we're referring to here? Yeah. So if you have a binary for a disk image, there is a program that you can still buy today on a website that looks like it was last updated in 1993. But off that website, you can buy a program or even buy a five and a quarter inch floppy disk that you can pop into an Apple II that will let it receive binary data over the serial modem line and write it to a disk. So then you need to connect your modern computer to the serial modem line, which involves having a USB to RS-232 serial adapter, and then a RS-232 to null modem adapter, which again, apparently you can still buy today. I'm not sure how many are sold every year, but you can at least still get one. So then you're sending the serial data from your new computer awesome. over to the old one and running this old piece of software that then is just directly writing all the bytes to the disk. It definitely, when it fails, it fails pretty spectacularly and just leaves you with total garbage on the screen. But luckily, at least the Apple II that I have doesn't have a hard disk on it. So if anything ever went categori- uh, catastrophically lo- wrong, you can just turn it off, turn it back on again, and the whole world has been wiped away and you can start fresh again. I remember that. We just... Uh... We were we were always playing Jack and the Beanstalk, and we would have to start over every week. We went to the computer lab because oh that's how it worked. <laughs> I remember playing like Oregon Trail and stuff on there. Um, yeah, we have one copy of that for the class. I still have my childhood copy of uh, Tetris, which has written on the box of the Soviet Challenge, which is a, a fun <laughs> one to still break out and play every so often. Nice. So so I'm a little curious. I mean, these machines don't really have a ton of memory or anything else on there. So how much can you actually do with Ruby on the Apple II? The memory is going to vary. The 
I believe the smallest amount you could get when it first came out was 8K of memory. And it's worth noting that on the Apple II, the system, the memory for the entire system is also shared with video memory. So just to put characters on the screen, you've already eaten up, you know, some number of bytes to store all the characters you're putting on the screen. Later versions came with up to 64 kilobytes of memory or through a little bit of weird hacking, they managed to get up to, I think, around 128 kilobytes of memory. So you have what I would consider a fair amount of room to do stuff. The main limitation of, so the version of Ruby that I've been working on, I called NRuby because it's M Ruby is the small Ruby and we need something smaller than M. So it's N Ruby. <laughs> nice. So the main constraint that I have right now and how much you can do is every object, like in, like in uh, C Ruby, every object has a unique pointer to it, which ends up being a pointer to an address on the heap. And in order to get things compact enough, I have every object represented by a one byte, a unique ID that can be translated into a pointer in memory, which means you can only have 256 objects total. And that includes the 200 or the, the however many objects you have for like, there's the true object, the false object, the class object, the object <laughs> object, all, all the, all the built-in classes take up a little bit of that memory. There's a little bit of hacking that you can do so that it, it doesn't end up, you know, just filling all of memory with built-ins, but it still takes up a fair amount. And it's worth noting, so you have 256 slots in memory that you can occupy, but if you have an array that takes up larger than the, I think it's a 16-byte limit per slot, it then spills over into another slot. And so now you've you know decreased the number of objects that you can have by one just by having an array that has you know 15 elements in it, or uh, I can't remember what the exact limits are. So with all that you know theoretical maximum of 256 objects, the methods that I've been working on are pretty bare bones and basic because you know you're not gonna you're probably not gonna be running Ruby on Rails on an Apple II. You might be able to get like a very very compressed server on there if you do a lot of hand assembly work to optimize things under the hood. But that ends up being your main limitation is how many objects you actually have to work with. But within that, you know, you could make basic text games or you know like a Hangman or a Tic Tac Toe or something like that. Obviously, this is not a practical endeavor so the 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 limitations are more like just do enough that you can technically call it a ruby and you can write a couple interesting programs and that's that's good enough for me so what are the limit or what what i guess what apis did you get in and what apis did you not get in so i'm still actively working on it right now i'm struggling with there's a difference between how memory is being initialize in my emulator and how it's being initialized in real hardware that's causing some problems but as far as uh, what we have right now you have your basic array operations so you can push and pop off rays and index into them your basic class and module things you can create a module with a bunch of of, um, methods in it included into a class and you can create class your own custom classes with your own custom methods you have you know basic integer math basic string operations to concatenate strings, pull characters off them, print statements, inspect. So re- really the bare, bare fundamentals. It's kind of like you can do about as much as you can do in like the C programming language as far as built-in primitives. But of course, much, much nicer syntax right? because it's Ruby. It's also worth noting that the 6502 processor in the Apple II runs at one megahertz, which means, you know, you can scream through assembly language, but it takes a lot of assembly calls to do an object lookup, figure out what class it is, uh, look at the virtual method table, find the actual code that you're going to call. And so the other limitation is that, you know, things are running at a relatively slow speed. The way that, you know, basic and other built-in languages in uh, old computers like the Apple II ran really fast as they had much, much more optimized systems with much more reduced data types. But to get all the flexibility of having things like the define method method in Ruby, it means you're doing a lot of lookups and memory lookups are pretty slow when you're running at one megahertz. So what you're saying is the faster our CPUs and processors and better our hardware gets, the more abstracted we get or we can be. We've totally taken advantage of that. I'm really curious what's going to happen to computing, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now as computers keep getting more powerful. Because if we, you know, within a couple decades managed to go from machine code programming where you're just 
hard writing bits onto a machine and having to just move around individual bytes in memory to, you know, modern Ruby. If we manage to get there in 30 years, I'm curious as machines get more powerful and we can kind of rely on the machine to do more and more of the hard work, how much further languages can get pushed. My thought is we're only going to consider it a memory leak if it's using more than five petabytes of memory. (laughs) I think our coding is going to get a lot sloppier, honestly, because the hardware will more than make up for our horrible programming. I recently went to a talk on some supercomputer design stuff, and they mentioned that each supercomputer node in their test setup only has two terabytes of RAM per node. So yeah. That's I, rough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, could, could you start Rails on only two terabytes of RAM? Uh, You'd have you two have Chrome it. tabs open. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We're going there, are we? So I'm curious, you know, you kind of uh, talked about this as sort of being, you know, a useless project. I mean, it's not something that anybody's going to use for anything that valuable. What are you learning from building this, though? One thing is I got a degree in performance art and theater. I don't have a computer science background. And so all the basic fundamentals of how computers work and, you know, low-level programming, I'm learning through projects like this rather than going through a course. So I am learning how does memory actually work under the hood? How do you how do you write a garbage collector? How do you deal with heaps and stacks and doing manual memory management, which then helps better understand kind of the the core parts of Ruby. I mean, when you look at the release notes for Ruby, you'll see like there's a bunch of new methods that we can use, but often they're doing things like improving hash lookup by implementing and then they name some fancy algorithm. So with projects like this, I'm personally learning this stuff, but Also, you know, it's giving me an opportunity to kind of just have fun with computers. I often, you know, day-to-day work can get a little bit tiring because you're, you know, working towards sprint objectives and kind of building out these things for users and kind of losing a bit of the fun of just sitting down on a computer and just kind of playing around with it and seeing what you can do. So some of it is just, a lot of it's just purely for the entertainment value. And beyond that, you know, it's also through giving talks about this, as well as providing some documentation and been getting a fair number of emails from people asking various questions about how things actually work under the hood, because they want to try it themselves. And I'm hoping I can encourage more people to kind of go out and play with computers and especially play with old computers. Because if you were to try and manually write assembly to run on like a modern x86 processor that runs in most of our laptops, it's a fair amount more complicated. And the operating system that you're running in is a lot harder to understand. And I think that scares a lot of people away from kind of learning these lower level fundamentals. Go all the way back, you know, 20, 30 years, 40 years to a lot of these much older computers. You can learn a lot about how computers work under the hood and the basics and play around in a much simpler, or safer environment. So part of this project is also trying to encourage other people to kind of go out and just just play with these older machines and see what they can do. Uh, another question that I have is, how much free time do you have? <laughs> Not too much, which is why, I mean, so I started this project around a year ago, a bit more than a year ago, maybe. And one reason why I've only made as much progress as I've had is due to relatively limited free time. This is definitely one of those projects where every couple weekends I can set aside a couple hours, go to a coffee shop, put on some headphones and just hack on it. But it's actually... One of the nice things about writing assembly code on these old computers that are very limited is there's not actually that much code that you can run. So you're not going to be writing like a multi-million line application. So even though it sounds like writing an entire programming language might be difficult, or at least it might sound that way to some people, because the computer can't do that much, you're limited in how much you can write. And so it takes a lot less time than you would think. I think in this case, it took, oh, maybe eight or 10 hours work total to write an entire memory management system. It's not a very good one. It's not very efficient. It doesn't manage that much memory. But I mean, you can get up and running with not that much time. So is this thing done? And do you have another thing like on your list that you're looking at? Do you quit your experiments like this partway through when another more interesting experiment comes along? What do, what does it look like, I guess? what What is your experimental mind am i making some sense here like what yeah, kinds yeah, of, yeah. it looks like you've done a bunch of these kinds of things how does that happen 
I definitely always have a lot of irons in the fire at a given time. So whenever I get bored and frustrated with one project and kind of hit a wall, open up a fresh tab in the text editor and start just playing in something else or pick up another project that I previously got frustrated with. I think it's definitely, I find it very helpful to always have multiple side projects going on because if you just work on one, as soon as you get frustrated, as soon as you hit a difficult thing that you can't figure out, you just kind of, I don't know, at least I find I would just give up, quit, and never open it again. Whereas if I have multiple projects, I can always just kind of switch between them. And every time I come to a project after a couple of weeks of working on something else, it's always fresh and new. As for the current state of NRuby, it's definitely not done. One of the biggest challenges right now is getting the parser to not be terrible. Right now, you can enter many different things that look like valid Ruby programs that cause horrendous bugs that cause the whole machine to come crash into a halt. And if any of you have ever tried to write a parser, which I definitely recommend doing, it's pretty easy to do in a language like Ruby. If you try and write a simple parser in a higher level language, it's not too bad. If you're trying to write it in raw assembly and you're just like looking at each byte value individually, uh, debugging it becomes a massive, massive pain. So that's one of the main holdups with this project is trying to trying to get all the nitty gritty details working as far as you know, the syntax and everything so that you can actually write a Ruby program rather than having to hand code everything in memory and then run it. Speaking um, of, how yep. is debugging? Ah, what kinds of tools yes. do you have? <laughs> so the emulator that I use, I use an emulator called Virtual, I think it's called Virtual 2. It has a built-in debugger. You can uh, look at all of memory and set a breakpoint in memory to say, if code execution ever gets this point, open the debugger. So I'll set a breakpoint at the point in memory that I want to do. And then it's literally just hand stepping through every single assembly instruction in the program from that point and looking at what are all the values in the register at this point? What are all the values in memory? And then constantly going back and forth to what, what the actual program is doing and then what I have in my notes about what it's supposed to be doing and trying to figure out, you know, okay, if this flag gets set here, but then it jumps to this point, it'll calls all sorts of things. It's not too different from stepping through, you know, a normal Ruby program using something like Pry, but it's uh, because you're dealing with assembly and because you're just looking at raw bytes in memory. For example, like when I'm storing characters in memory, unfortunately, the character display is not quite giving me the right encoding. So I have to, every time I want to check if it's printing out something, I have to look at the hex value for the character that's in memory then go over to a table that has all the different hex values for the custom Apple II character encoding, look up what that character is, and then go back to the program and figure out if that's what I want to do. So uh, de debugging is definitely a nightmare. That's probably the main thing that has slowed down this project. I just want to say that reminds we had to do some of this in college. I was a computer engineering major, and so we had like really small chip emulators. And yeah, we would write code. And, you know, we, we had to like write interrupt handlers and stuff. So a little lower level than even what you're dealing with and all of that stuff. Yeah, that was the debugging method was, okay, freeze. What's in the registers? What's in memory? What are we looking at? And then, yeah, step through it and try and figure out what's changing, why it's changing and what instructions we got wrong writing assembly code for the emulator. I will say that I do feel particularly lucky that I have this emulator that I can do this on. When Steve Wozniak was originally writing all this, he had to, not in assembly, but in actual machine code, writing raw hex values, write the original debugging programs for the Apple II that are still buried deep in memory. So write those out without any debugging tools, and then use the most bare bones, basic, hard-coded debugging tools to figure out what his program was doing. Or even worse, I, my father will tell me stories whenever I'm complaining about difficulties with computers nowadays or difficulties of having it work. He'll remind me that when he was in college, they would write out their programs on punch cards. And then it was, you know, way too expensive to actually like get to the machine and run your program if you want to just debug it. So they'd hand, they'd take the stack of punch cards, sit down at a table with their friends. One person would be the accumulator register. One person would be, you know, the arithmetic oh, wow. unit. And they would hand go <laughs> through every punch card and say, okay, at this point, accumulator, you're holding the number five. And the person would remember that they're holding the number five. And okay, you need to then run an ad instruction and go through and just walk through it with a group of people at the table. I can't imagine how, how hard debugging would be if we had to do that every day. 
So Mike, do you have any automated tests written? I do. That's actually what, one of the things that has made this project possible for me, at least, is I've actually been doing test-driven development in assembly. So I have, I need to put it up on GitHub. I have a, a little test framework that lets you call to a subroutine that you want to do a unit test for in your assembly. And then there's a little macro that just inserts the assembly commands to check whether or not a given register is set to an expected value. And then based off that, it'll print out a character to the screen. And so doing that, able to do uh, full test room development assembly, it definitely makes things a lot easier when you're editing one part of code and all of a sudden it goes off and destroys some other, some other part of the program. Hey folks, this is Charles Maxwood and I just launched my book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. It's up on Amazon. We self-published it. I would love your support. If you want to go check it out, you can find it there. The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. Have a good one. Max out. I'm actually curious how anyone managed to do assembly programming before techniques like test-driven development were developed because I can't imagine just trying to run this stuff and just guess whether or not it's working. <laughs> <laughs> Large QA departments. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I think it's actually interesting that some of the points that you brought up, right? Like, so Steve Wozniak's goal, right, wasn't to write, well, okay, so referring to the one you were just discussing, his goal there was to write a debugger, right? So I think, I think it's interesting because all of this fits together. Like, clearly, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Like, we're writing programs that do all these crazy things because somebody wrote debuggers and assemblers and compilers for us, right? But back when they were first starting to do that, their their goals were smaller. I just think you, it's cool. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, the first C compiler was, you know, handwritten assembly. It took a while before they had a C compiler good enough that they could write C in C. You know, we take we take a lot of things for granted nowadays that someone at some point someone had to write it out. I mean, the 6502 processor that the Apple II runs on, that was legitimately the, the individual transistors in that chip were hand laid out by people like cutting out pieces of vinyl and like gluing them onto like a big sheet to hand lay out every single transistor and every single wire in that chip because, you know, computers were big and expensive and not powerful enough to do something like design an entire uh, processor. So some people had to, you know, actually hand cut out the masks for making uh, a lot of the chips that then eventually those chips became powerful enough that they could run programs to develop those chips and so on. And now we use chemicals and lasers and things to make our transistors because they're so small that you could, can't even see them. <laughs> and the, there's actually a, an emulator of the 6502 processor that emulates it at an individual transistor level. They mapped out every single transistor on the chip, the voltage differentials between them, a little bit of the uh, solid state physics that goes on inside of it, and this entire emulator for the 6502 processor uh, that runs at a physics level runs in JavaScript on your machine at a surprisingly fast speed. <laughs> <laughs> this is how wow. far we've come. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, this reminds me a little bit. I mean, we weren't hand laying them out as far as like cutting out pieces of vinyl and sticking them places but we had to do some chip design with some cad tools for you know for my major and that was hard enough i mean i i can't even imagine right and the computer would tell us you can't put that there because it's too close it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna cause some issues you know with the circuit next to it and <laughs> yeah i mean we, we've got it pretty good again i really i'm really curious what it is that's gonna exist some decades from now where people look back at the way that we write programs today and say, they used to do it that way? That seems so hard. It reminds me a little bit of, there's a scene in Back to the Future 2 where he goes in and he plays the video game and then the kids are, look at him and go, you used your hands? <laughs> so I really want to know about some of, some of these stories that you mentioned at the end of this thing. Because I've run into some really weird bugs in my career that you know you just move on you're like that was terrible i don't really want to know exactly how that works but uh you've definitely got some interesting ones down here especially uh, the the tab space one so this was a number of years ago i was applying for a job at a ruby development company and they 
they gave a coding assignment before you'd come in for an interview to create a relatively basic program that would parse some input from standard in, perform some calculations on it, return an output. And looking at the program, you know, trying to do it well with nice test suite and all that jazz to uh, try to get the job, I realized that there'd be a great way to code golf the program where instead of parsing user input and then um, turning it into data and then performing your calculations and printing it out, you could instead take the user input as a string, run a series of G sub calls, so do regular expression replacements on the user input to replace each line of the user input with uh, code that would evaluate, then call eval on the string that you get, and then that would end up producing the output. So it ended up being that, you know, could do the entire programming prompt that they wanted for the job in, oh, I think it was like 160 characters or something like that. Whereas oh, the full version with a test suite was, you know, hundreds of lines long. So while working on that program, as it turns out, if you're writing a Ruby program or a program in any language where you are performing regular expressions on a s- string and doing a string replacement to create an actual program string that you can then eval, you have to be very careful with how things overwrite each other and you can get all sorts of hilarious and weird bugs. And it there, at one point, the program stopped working when I made a change, and I could not figure out what was wrong. And after a very long time, eventually managed to figure out that the entire program was uh, crashing because the Ruby keyword while ends with the letter E. And I had some regular expression that was looking for a string that ends with an E. And so the obvious solution to this was to replace a uh, space with a tab in the program, and then the whole program ran fine, which... I don't know if I'll ever encounter a bug again where the white space in your program ends up causing the bug, but that, that was a good time. That makes tons of sense now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that being said, I gave my code golf version of the program to a friend I had who worked at the company, and uh, he ran it through his test suite, and it turned out my code golf version passed the test suite and worked perfectly fine, did everything that they wanted. If you read it very carefully, there was a really, really horrendous script injection issue where someone could put in user input that would let them gain total access to your machine. We'll ignore that. They weren't testing for you know security. However, I had given him the code golf version of the program assignment to review before I had submitted the real one and realized that I now have a real program, which I don't know if it passes the full test suite, and a code golf version, which I know does and was praying as hard as I could that it wasn't that I was better at writing the code golf version and that my real version would fail the test suite. Because I didn't want my my best reference implementation to be 160 characters of incomprehensible garbage. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, all right. So I also am a fine arts major. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if I've ever said that on this show or whatever, but I was actually a music major. You're fired. <laughs> and and so I'm just kind of curious. I always find that it informs me differently to have that kind of background. You you mentioned it earlier. How does that play for you? Like how does it affect your career? Do you see it as a plus or a minus? I'm always a strong proponent when dealing with hiring to try and get people from as many and as diverse backgrounds as possible. For example, My degree was split between fine arts and theater. Working in the theater world, like we talk about in programming, about putting out fires and having bad days and having emergencies. But, you know, in the theater world, it's not unheard of to work on a show where it's, you know, eight hours before the first audience comes in and everything has fallen apart, all your tech is broken, and you need to like come up with a hacky fix before there are literal bodies and seats to do it. Or, You're working on a rehearsal and literally something catches on fire. And so you're putting out of fires is literally putting out fires during your job. And that kind of working in that background and then coming to the programming world, it kind of puts a lot of things in perspective and helps, you know, maintain your calm under hard situations or uh, deal with emergencies in a bit healthier ways. But, you know, all the people I work with, I always find it interesting. Everyone who comes from a different background, they kind of, they always bring something new to the conversation. They have a new way of looking at problems. Someone who, you know, is a humanities major might, you know, come up with a completely different solution to a problem than someone who got a computer science degree, because maybe instead of immediately going to, we'll write a program to solve the problem, they may see that, you know, there's like 
a communications way to solve it, that maybe we don't need to write this whole new system to do some new feature that users are requesting. Instead, we can, you know, communicate our existing stuff in a different way or, you know, provide some different help texts and kind of make everything work in a much easier way. I mean, the other nice thing is that, you know, when you have people coming from all sorts of different backgrounds at work, it means that your water cooler conversations are generally a lot more interesting. <laughs> True. I, I can't I can't speak universally, but it seems like the experience of a fine arts major is very different than a, the experience of an engineering major. I definitely did a lot of real, real weird things back in the college days that make for interesting stories now. Well, it's interesting to me, too. I mean, I've probably worked with as many college dropouts as I have CS or computer engineering majors. For the most part, it didn't matter, right? They, they, they did the job. They did the job well. And, you know, in a lot of cases, we got to be really good friends, even though we had kind of a different background from each other. And I will, I will just say that I also do love working with people who got CS degrees because, I mean, it's d- diversity, I think, is the most important thing, not coming from one particular background better than another. Because, I mean, yeah. people with CS degrees, you know, we've, we've encountered problems at work where you need to be able to read through the assembly code to figure out that some x86 instruction isn't compiling correctly because of some weird flag or something. And as a fine arts major, it takes a lot longer for me to learn what all those words mean to kind of get up to the point where I can understand what the problem is, even is. Whereas somebody who got a CS degree who studied computer architectures in school, who spent some time doing assembly as part of their training, you know, that those kinds of skills are learning that, you know, we could like do a fancy or try to write a fancy program to do this, but there's an existing algorithm that, you know, just look up this paper mm-hmm. and then implement a version of that algorithm. Like, I, I mean, I love working with CS majors. They're, they're definitely fantastic. So I don't, I don't want to put them down yeah. as a, a bad thing. Yeah, but it is, it's that ability, right, to look at the problem and have everybody come up with a different idea of how to solve it and realize that, you know, the answer may lie in the combination of those things. So without the diversity, you wouldn't have any of it or you'd only have a piece of it. And there's a lot of good research out there now that companies that are more diverse and have more people from more backgrounds, both in their engineering departments, but also, you know, on their board of directors, they're even more financially successful. I mean, it isn't just like a a wishy-washy thing. There's now some pretty hard evidence that this is, in fact, a good thing for a lot of different metrics. That's one reason why a lot of the really big companies put out big diversity efforts. It's not just necessarily a PR thing. They, They understand that the more diverse you are as an organization, the happier you're going to be, the more productive you're going to be. And at the end of the day, it does often mean that your bottom line is better, which is you know what some people care about. Yeah, but it's, it's the difference in the way that you think about the problems that I think really boils down to you know, the ability to, to find those solutions. Totally. I mean, like often there, everyone in the room may be thinking of, you know, one particular solution to a thing and the obvious way to do it. But there's someone who just from a previous job or from somewhere else, they just have that slightly different way of thinking and they have the that kind of one outside the box solution that will, you know, check all the boxes with a one line code change. Or if we just, you know, rearrange these things, it'll it'll all work better. And it's it's never the same person. It's always a different person each time, at least in my experience. So what other, I mean, in our prep notes, you gave us a couple of other examples of some kind of wacky things that people have done. You you kind of put up winning entries and honorable mentions from the 2018 Transcendental Ruby Imbroglio contest for Ruby Kaigi. So what is the contest? And then how do you win by writing crazy stuff? Yeah, so... This is a contest that happens at Ruby Kaigi, which is, I believe it's the largest Ruby conference in the world, it happens in Japan every year. They move around where they have it in Japan. But they run a contest every couple of years. It's not an annual thing. It's more an occasional thing called the Trick Contest, which is short for the Transcendental Ruby Imbroglio Contest for Ruby Kaigi, as you said, which is an interesting name. But the idea of the contest is to write Ruby, encourage people to write Ruby programs that take advantage of weird parts of the language or exploit it to do interesting things and kind of write code that is interesting purely because of the code, not necessarily because of what it does, but because of how you wrote it. And so 2018 was the first year I participated in this, and it was the last year that they ran it. 
And th- there's a lot of interesting stuff that comes out of that. Then they have a panel of uh, judges that will then go through and select winners across. <coughs> they make up categories depending on what the submissions are. To give you an example of like one of my personal favorite entries ever, which won last year, was a Ruby program that only uses the keywords. It's a program that uses every single keyword in the Ruby programming language and nothing else. So just uh, letters separated by spaces. And they arrange the keywords in a in sort of what looks like a grid that's very similar to the table of keywords that's in Ruby's internal documentation to say these are the sort of reserved words in the Ruby programming language. And they somehow managed to only using keywords, no periods, no parentheses, nothing else, only using the keywords, they got a valid Ruby program that will run. Now, mind you, the Ruby program doesn't do anything. It just like returns nil and just (laughs) exits. But I think that's, it kind of represents kind of the purest form of what this contest is going after. It is possibly the most difficult to write Ruby program that I've ever seen. They had to take advantage of all kinds of weird tricks and things to even get it to parse correctly as a Ruby program. And then not only to get it to parse correctly, but to get it to run and to only use keywords and nothing else. And then on top of that, to arrange it in this uh, very specific way so that it looks like the internal documentation. I mean, that is, that's, you know, that's Ruby programming on hard mode. And then on top of all that, the fact that it does nothing, I mean, that's just perfect, that you you spent all this time and effort to write a program in one of the most challenging ways I can imagine. And then at the end of it, it doesn't do anything, but that's that's kind of the whole point of it. So that was the program that won last year. The I put a, there are a couple of programs I put in there. One was a, it was a, uh, a Ruby testing library. So it gives, you know, ways to group together tests and make assertions and it'll print them out in a pretty way. And it gives you a nice API for writing tests, but the entire test framework is only 68 characters. And most of those characters are emoji. Um, so you can write all your tests just using emoji, which is, I, I find to be kind of fun or another program that's only 86. 87 characters long, but if you run in a Mac terminal, it will play a, a piece of music by a composer named Steve Reich. That one I especially like because I managed to get the entire program, a title, as well as a copyright statement for the program and a copyright statement for the piece of music all within a tweet, which I like when you nice. fit not only a program in a tweet, but also the documentation and legal statement. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm a complete amateur on this front. I mean, I know I'm a complete amateur on this front. <laughs> I was perfectly satisfied with Andrew Patterson's presentation where he was just like, oh, yeah, here we're just going to make a method name be an emoji. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's about <laughs> as far as I'm ever going to go here. One of my favorite uh, little things you can do in the Ruby programming language is, unlike a lot of other programming languages, the reason why emoji are valid method names is because the Ruby parser looks at all of the ASCII characters and it will distinguish between them. Like these are letters, these are numbers, these are you know parens and periods and stuff like that. But as far as valid value names, so things that you can use as the name of a variable, a method, a class, it will only let you use letters, numbers, and anything outside of the ASCII code space, which means all emoji are there. Uh, the reason why they do this is because then all foreign letters are there. But outside the ASCII code space, there are things like alternative space characters that are different widths, which means you can have a method name that contains spaces in it. So you can have a, a method called print name where there's a space instead of an underscore but between the two words, and then you can call it with that space in there. And it just happens to be that the space is not the one you get from hitting the space bar, but one that's hidden somewhere else in the Unicode code space. So, I mean, it's, yeah. It's it's every, uh, one of the things I love about the Ruby programming language. Every single part of it has a fun little thing that you can use for practical purposes, like creating method names that you know are in foreign languages. So if you're, you know, a Russian developer, you can use Cyrillic characters. Or if you're a Japanese developer, you can have Japanese method names if you want using kanji. But then it also, by side effect, also means that you can put spaces in your method name, and it'll still call it just fine if you know what you're doing. Or in the comments, if you do. Ruby. Yeah. Hmm? And now I want to go break Ruby. I, I would definitely encourage it. I love Ruby because like good idiomatic Ruby to me looks like really readable. Like it's it's the programming language that I enjoy writing in the most because it, you know, it it always reads very cleanly and very nice. But then it gives you all these features that you can just abuse and use for terrible, terrible dark purposes. It's the only language I know of that sets this beautiful balance between readability and consistency and then letting you do horrible, horrible things to it. 
It's it's art. I mean, <laughs> right? Take the rules away. You can make pretty things. You can also make very ugly things. <laughs> okay, so before we like lose you and you have no more time, <laughs> what what out of all your stories, like because you have a bunch here, is there one that like you just like really want to share? There's a good one that I think I also sometimes think about as just like a good. There's actually a practical thing behind the story, which is so back in college, I was working on a, a concert with a number of other artists and musicians. And the idea with the concert is they wanted to do a live concert with people improvising in different locations. The initial version was different locations across the US, but they eventually wanted to go around the world. And so you'd have people playing music in New York, in Detroit, in Virginia, in Chicago, all at the same time, kind of playing together. The caveat is that the person came up with the concept that rather than the normal kind of live streaming thing where there's, you know, like a very slight but usually nowadays pretty imperceptible delay between when you hear the audio from the different locations, they wanted there to be a delay between each location equal to the amount of time that it would take sound to travel that distance. So it'd be a concert where at, you know, 6 p.m. or whenever the show started, everyone would start playing and you wouldn't hear the other locations until there had been enough time for the sound to actually have physically traveled from that location. And then the stream from that location would start playing, which is kind of a cool idea how it actually sounds when, you know, musicians are 10 minutes or an hour apart from each other in terms of delay. It sounds interesting because you'll react to a note and then they won't hear you uh, again for another 10 minutes because the note that you're hearing now was played 10 minutes ago. So definitely an interesting challenge for the musicians. But the technical challenge was we needed to be streaming audio across the internet and we needed these massive delays between, I think the shortest one was 10 minutes and the longest one was an hour, hour and a half, somewhere in that region. The problem is most audio programs, if they'll let you set the delay up to you know an hour in length or more, If you do that, it will immediately allocate that much memory on your computer. And in the case of uncompressed audio, an hour of audio is, you know, around like four gigabytes or something, a couple gigabytes. It can be it can be really massive when you're dealing with uncompressed audio streams. So we have this technical challenge of we need to be streaming uh, audio across the internet. Which, if you're handwriting streaming code, that's not not necessarily the easiest thing to do unless you have a lot of libraries to do it for you. But in addition to that, we need these really really long audio delays. So it took a little while to come up with a solution. We kept trying the standard way to solve this problem of writing really long audio delays and using various you know, C libraries or Java libraries to do audio streaming. Nothing was really working. It was too resource intensive on all the computers. Eventually, we figured out that there was a way to solve both the streaming problem and the delay problem, which was to, instead of live streaming all the audio, each location would just record the audio that was happening And every five minutes or 15 minutes, it would save off a WAV file onto the computer in a folder. And so each location would just um, record its audio in real time and save them off as a stream of files. Then we made it so that they were all saving into a Dropbox folder. And so then each location is sharing the files with each other location. And the name of each of the files would have a timestamp in the name. And then each location would then have a separate program that would look at the timestamps, figure out the delay, and then just start playing back the recorded versions of the files with however long a delay we wanted. And this meant we could create delays that were arbitrarily long, you know, even like a day-long audio delay. And it wouldn't take up any extra memory in the machine because we're just, it would take up, you know, hard disk space, but hard disks are a lot more plentiful than RAM. And then for streaming, I mean, we just use Dropbox because Dropbox is terrible for streaming audio if you need like really low latency because you know, transferring files is a relatively high latency operation, but we, of course, wanted incredibly high latency, and so Dropbox worked out perfectly. And I often think of that story when, like, working on projects and things when we have, like, really challenging things that are getting really resource-intensive at work, trying to think, like, is there, like, a really dumb, stupid, simple MVP solution that would just kind of solve this, even if it's not, you know, the quote-unquote right way to do it? Yeah. Makes total sense. It's clever. I know that there was... a. Uh, the program itself that ran all this was very, very poorly written because it uh, apparently when you take uh, programming classes as an art student through the School of Art and Design rather than school, through the School of Computer Programming, they don't teach you how to write good programs. So now I look back at all those programs I wrote in art school and realize, you know, these are 
these are pretty terrible. Variable names don't make any sense. There's no comments in any of the code. It's all just a big spaghetti mess of switch statements. But hey, it works. Sounds like the code I write today. <laughs> that ruins my point of you get better at writing code as you get older. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's one of those paradoxical things where you get better, but you also notice more problems. So it, it just seems like it looks a lot worse to you every single day. <laughs> Maybe. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. I guess before we do that, though, we should ask you, Colin, if people want to check this stuff out, see what you're working on now, connect with you online, wh- where is all that stuff? So I'm very bad about doing online communication stuff. But you can follow me on Twitter. It's at Peter Quines, P-E-T-E-R-Q-U-I-N-E-S. I'll occasionally post this stuff whenever a new project comes out. And when the Apple II project finally is kind of at a version 1.0 state, I'll be posting it there and posting links to GitHub. Also, there's a side project that I'm working on, which is trying to get uh, the same version of Ruby, but much reduced working on a uh, Nintendo Entertainment System, an old uh, Nintendo game system. So all that stuff will be posted on Twitter once I actually get completed. Just be be patient and careful. It's, it's going to be a while. Also, I always welcome people. Reach out to me. You can email me at j-u-s-t-c-o-l-i-n at gmail.com, just colin at gmail.com. Always happy to talk to people, maybe a little bit slow responding, but anyone who wants to talk about this stuff or wants to share interesting, cool things that they're doing, I'm, I'm always happy to, to listen to other people. One of my favorite communities in programming these days is the Angular community. Every time I go to an Angular conference or meet up with some of my friends who are in the Angular community, I have a great time. And a lot of them have wound up on Adventures in Angular. So if you're doing front-end development, you're looking for a way to keep current on the Angular ecosystem, and you want to have a good time listening to fun people talk about great topics related to Angular, then go check out Adventures in Angular at adventuresinangular.com. All right, let's go ahead and do some picks. Dave, do you have some picks for us? Yeah, just one. It is a swing line guillotine paper cutter. So I have a bunch of kids, three kids that are six and under. So doing schoolwork and other kind of crafts things gets to be really annoying to have to cut everything by a hand or a straight edge. So we got one of those off Amazon for like 20 bucks, 25 bucks, and it's been pretty amazing. So fun for the whole family. Awesome. Don, what are your picks? I'm, I'm still like laughing that it's a guillotine uh, paper cutter, but I do have two picks. So my first one is, is a little bit abstract. So I have this React Native app that that I inherited from somebody else. And I could talk about how much I hate React Native, but this week I had a bug that uh, if, you're, if you've done any app development before, especially iOS, you submit your app and you have to wait for iOS to like approve it before you can you know, push it out. So if you have a bug that's in production, you can either wait like a couple days or one of the things that's really nice about React, begrudgingly, is hot reloading, right? So that completely saved my butt this week. So there's a point in in hot reloading's favor. So totally, I'm picking hot reloading because it kind of saved my butt. That was really nice. But the other thing is, so I grew up in Texas. I'm kind of picky about salsa. I don't know if everyone that grows up in Texas is, but but I am. And, And my wife is also... Um, she became gluten intolerant later in life. So we also like things that we eat matter now. So anyway, the point is it's hard to find salsa that I shouldn't say it's hard to find gluten-free salsa, but there are some salsas that are not. Anyway, point is my wife and I both eat the salsa and I like it. I live in North Carolina now where I feel like I don't have as much good salsa anymore. And so I found this one salsa that I was only able to buy from this one place for a time. And now Walmart sells it. And it's awesome. But it's just cleansed Texas salsa. And I'm just like, this is acceptable salsa. I don't have to go to a restaurant to get good salsa. I can buy it at Walmart. It's awesome. Nice. It. Yeah, my sister has a gluten allergy. And it's amazing the stuff that she can't eat. You're like, there's really wheat in that? Do yep. this wheat and everything. And you, you yeah. discover this when you yeah, have a relative that has gluten problems. Yep. I'm going to throw a couple of picks out. The first one is, is 
This week, as we speak, we launched the Clean Coders podcast. Yes, that is a partnership with Clean Coders. And I've been doing the interviews. The first interview and the second interview are out today as we record this. The first one is with Uncle Bob Martin. The second one is with, who was it with? Daniel Markham. And those were fun. The first one was awesome. The third one, which comes out tomorrow, because I'm releasing one a week that, throughout this week, was with Chris Powers. And that one also is just incredible. So go check it out, devchat.tv slash clean dash coders. And yeah, I've, I've really been enjoying doing these interviews and I'm looking forward to sharing them all with everybody. So yeah, go check those out. And then the other pick I have is Star Trek Picard. It's on the CBS app. My wife has a subscription to that because she can't live without Survivor and stuff. So we've been watching that and it's it's been pretty good so far. The first two episodes have been great. So I'm really enjoying that. And so I'm going to pick that. Colin, do you have some picks for us? So I sometimes will do electronic projects and uh, heat shrink tubing as a thing. And I have spent the past couple decades of my life always doing uh, using a lighter to shrink heat shrink tubing and recently decided to become an adult and buy a heat gun. It is only $20 and it has changed my entire life forever. I, I feel like there's fresh new vistas ahead of me. I just want to add heat shrink tubing to everything now that it's so easy to do. Um, <laughs> not a problem that most people have, I know, but it's uh, if, if, you're, if you are like me and you use a lighter to do heat shrink tubing, the, the $20 investment in a heat gun is totally worth it. I have a Porter Cable one, and that thing heats up so fast. It's like instant shrinkage on the tubes. They, it's a little, it's a little scary how fast it goes. And also, if you uh, accidentally point at the wrong thing, you start chipping paint, which is uh, uh, a little bit frightening the first time you accidentally do it. <laughs> but, but it doesn't blow out your circuits like, like a, a blow dryer does. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Yeah, we'll have another one next week. And in the meantime, Max out. Talk to you all later. Later. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.